afternoon. Uh, my name is William Edwards. I'm the vice chair of the World Affairs Council of Orange County out here on the left coast of the US. Uh, welcome to our webinar on the impact of cyber tactics on the economy, politics, diplomacy, and future wars. Probably should be current wars, the way things are going these days. Um, I wanted to highlight the uh, procedure we're going to follow with questions. Uh, you can put your questions in the uh, Q&A button down on the bottom right. And I will come back after uh, Dimitri's talk and uh, ask him those questions. We'll finish up his uh, his his section about uh, 1.30 our time out here on the left coast and then have a few minutes for questions. Uh, I would like now to introduce our moderator, Del Quinton Wilbur, who is assistant editor in the Los Angeles Times Washington DC Bureau. Before that, he's been uh, an enterprise and investigative reporter on criminal justice and national security. Previously worked uh, with the Baltimore Sun, the Washington Post, uh, Bloomberg News, and the Wall Street Journal. He's also an accomplished author, including a book called Brahe Down, The Near Assassination, Assassination of Ronald Reagan. Dimitri, over to you. Hey, thank I'm you sorry, very much. Dell, Dell, over to Dell. Like, I apologize, Dell <laughs> Wilbur. <laughs> My fault. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, I'd rather be Dimitri. Um, hey, Dimitri. Hey, uh, Del Wilbur here. I'm the White House editor um, at the uh, Los Angeles Time, I'm, Times. I'm a longtime criminal justice, national security writer for a bunch of newspapers. And that's how I came across Dimitri and covering cybersecurity and cyber attacks and hacking. I've interviewed you a couple times, I think, three or four times maybe over the wow. years. Always, always gave me great insights. Dimitri is the co-founder and chairman of the Silverado Policy Accelerator, a nonprofit that advances um, American prosperity and global leadership into this next century. And the co-founder and former chief technology officer of CrowdStrike, which was basically, for all of you watching, um, probably one of the top cybersecurity firms in the world. And it was the one that investigated the DNC hack for the DNC and found the Russians in embedded in the DNC servers. Correct, Dimitri, I have that right, if I remember? Right, of years right. Ago. And so we're really fortunate to have Dimitri here because he's like a leading authority on cybersecurity. And right now we're in the midst of this, you know, potential larger invasion war in Ukraine. Uh, the US government's kind of scrambling to figure out what to do about, you know, these Russian cyber attacks, the ransomware attacks, you know, the, the theft of, of data all over the place from the US government, from businesses. And I think I'd start like, Dimitri, with everything that you know and all you've been doing, what's the state of play right now with the Russians in terms of, you know, cyber warfare, hacking, and what, what should be, we be looking out for now with what's going on in Ukraine? Well, let's start with the, sort of the geopolitical aspects. And, and by the way, thank you, the World Affairs Council, for having me. Thanks, Del, for agreeing to, to do this uh, fireside chat in the Zoom era. So, uh, you know, I've actually been a close student of Russian history, Russian military, um, and geopolitical interests for uh, a number of decades now. And uh, I made a prediction on Twitter, on my Twitter feed, uh, back in early December, that I think Vladimir Putin was highly likely to invade Ukraine to accomplish his key objectives. And um, unfortunately, my predictions have proven true right now, where he has amassed uh, almost 200,000 forces on the border of Ukraine. He now has a pretext for invasion uh, with the recognition um, earlier this week of these separatist republics, DNR and LNR, is independent countries. And uh, he had given this long, hour-long speech um, uh, when he recognized those republics that went on and on about how Ukraine should not exist as a country, how it's a fluke of history, how Vladimir Lenin, of all people, invented it. Um, all uh, wrong, by the way. But... Um, the most important thing that he said was the very last thing after this Arlon diatribe and after he recognized DNR and LNR, he said that uh, if the Ukraine military does not end, quote unquote, their provocations in the military domain against those republics, they will suffer the consequences. So that is basically the pretext that's been set up. 
where, you know, whether the Ukrainians decide to do something or not, um, they will invent them doing this, uh, even if it doesn't happen in practice, and, and the Russian forces can roll into Ukraine and really change the government in Ukraine, which I think is going to be their ultimate objectives. How, how does cyber impact all of this? Um, well, uh, there are a couple of things. In cyberspace, when it comes to Ukraine, I think the Russians can do a number of things. One, they've been, of course, hammering Ukraine for the last eight years, um, since 2014, and, and the, the Maidan revolution there, with a variety of uh, cyber attacks escalating in their um, destructive power. Uh, they have taken down, for example, the electric grid in parts of Ukraine on two occasions in 2015 and 2016. They have done pretty severe interferences in their elections. Um, they have unleashed a number of destructive attacks. They've taken down networks of a huge number of Ukrainian companies. And in one case, in the case of not Petya attack back in 2017, um, that malware actually escaped Ukraine and uh, hit a number of major Western companies, including companies like Merck and Maersk and FedEx and others, uh, and inflicted a lot of damage. So um, uh, the Russians are, are highly, highly capable in the sphere. And I see them potentially executing three things um, as they march towards war here. One um, is something that they've been doing for a while now, which is inf infiltration of Ukrainian government networks, infiltration of their military networks to collect intelligence, to collect tactical intelligence about disposition of forces, uh, the types of orders that they're being given, um, uh, figuring out where um, their uh, key elements, including their artillery and air defense systems, uh, as well as their multiple uh, launch rocket systems are so that they can neutralize those things uh, with their air airstrikes and artillery forces. Uh, but the other piece is, is really interesting because they can really deeply integrate cyber capabilities alongside their kinetic strikes. They can do tactical uh, operations that, uh, that are designed to disrupt Ukrainian military, um, such as, for example, targeting the mobilization databases that have lists of people that the Ukrainians are going to call up um, when, uh, when the war begins. Um, they can do so by trying to destroy those databases in the first place. They can also try to impact communications. Um, you know, the Ukrainians are just going to email these people. They're going to text them to show up at certain locations. Um, they can both disrupt those communications and they can actually inject false information into those channels to redirect people to uh, other places and just cause pure havoc. Um, they can obviously do, uh, once again, attempt to take down power in certain strategic locations, particularly if they're doing before the, the main sort of event of the invasion, if they're doing special operations uh, raids to rescue some pro-Russian oligarchs. Um, um, there's one in particular um, by the name of Medvedchuk, who's a very close friend of Putin's. Putin is a godfather to his kids. He is uh, under house arrest in the suburb of Kiev. I expect that they will try to rescue him before the start of the war. Um, so if, it, it might be helpful to turn, down, turn off the power in that part of Kiev for a couple of hours while the operation is ongoing. Those are the types of things you can expect from them. And then lastly, uh, really an operation that is designed to impact the Ukrainian populace psychologically. So taking down of TV stations, uh, newspapers, uh, maybe changing content on them to try to spread misinformation. Those are the sorts of things you might see from them. What do we have to worry about in this country about with Russia? Will they be too preoccupied by what they're doing in Ukraine to really worry about like, I don't know, shutting off dam systems or, you know, doing ransomware attacks or there are their capabilities like it's endless, like it doesn't matter. So this is uh, a huge worry of mine. I just literally uh, minutes ago published an article in, in The Economist on this very thing. I worry a great deal of how this conflict that's currently contained within Ukraine can escape Ukraine and trigger a major escalation between Russia and the West. Um, that is not in anyone's interest, obviously. Um, and here's how I think it can unfold. Um, I don't believe that Russia will uh, strike first. In fact, all of the signals that they've been sending in the last couple of months have been basically indications to us, you know, Ukraine is ours, we're gonna take it, don't mess with it and everything will be okay. Uh, one of the things they've done, for example, just in the last couple of weeks, as you all know, Dal, is they've uh, arrested uh, some major ransomware gangs uh, in Moscow and St. Petersburg uh, including the gang that was responsible for the takedown of the Colonial Pipeline. Uh, some of the people in the audience may remember last May that shut down 
um, oil to the to the um, uh, to the East Coast. Um, that uh, is an, is uh, what I call ransomware diplomacy. Essentially, saying to the U.S., we can be very helpful to you on a range of things, including the cyber criminals, but we're not going to do anything if you hammer us with sanctions. And that's where I believe the, the dangerous point of escalation can be if we impose the types of sanctions that the Biden administration is talking about, the sanctions of the top three banks, essentially the equivalent of sanctioning you know, Goldman Sachs, Bank of America, and Citibank for Russia, huge impact on the economy. And on top of that, if we uh, impose a ban on exports of semiconductors to Russia, semiconductors, of course, are used in everything these days from weapon systems to cars, microwaves, fridges, consumer electronics, you name it, that will have a devastating effect on their economy, on their national security, if they can't, provide, uh, um, if they can't uh, develop weapon systems. So we're basically going to corner them, and they're not going to take that line down. They're going to lash out. They're going to lash out in a number of ways. Um, they can lash out economically. Uh, everyone talks about you know, Russia's power as a major exporter of oil and gas, and that's certainly true. Uh, but they're also an exporter of numerous critical materials. They're an exporter of titanium that we use in all of our jet engines, for example. They're exporter of uh, fertilizer. Two thirds of fertilizer comes from Russia. So they've already actually banned that export as of February 2nd through April 2nd. If they extend that, food prices will go uh, up around the world. Um, they're a major exporter of aluminum um, and uh, many, many other critical materials that we need, including, by the way, and that's actually Ukraine, but 70% of the neon gas that is used in the production of semiconductors is coming from Ukraine, which obviously in the case of war, they could shut down. That would be devastating to our semiconductor industry, which is already under enormous stress, as you well know, um, and uh, will further drive inflation across pretty much every part of our economy. So those are economic measures. And then on top of that is cyber. And they're highly capable in cyberspace. They can launch devastating attacks against us with both their ransomware groups, the criminal groups, as well as directly uh, with their intelligence agency. Could we respond? Sure. And certainly the National Security Agency uh, has enormous capabilities in cyber offense. But here's the thing that most people don't realize is the Russians fight dirty. Um, they are not going to uh, constrain themselves in a way that we would. For example, we would never target their hospitals. We would never target their civilian population um, and do the types of things that they would have zero concerns about doing. And um, um, it's going to be very difficult. And then on top of that, you know, we have to ask ourselves the question, is this tit for tat cyber war uh, between the US and, and the West uh, and Russia really in anyone's interest? Because I can tell you, if it progresses, it won't stay just in cyberspace and can easily spill over into uh, kinetic conflict. What are some of the more, we're talking about how they, they fight dirty and they act dirty. What are some of the kind of, I don't know, dirtier or more dirty, complex, interesting kind of hacks you've uncovered that like their Intel services have tried to use, do? Well, you know, obviously the, the famous one of the, of the US election in 2016 and, and trying to pin it on a lone, Amer uh, lone um, Romanian hacker, obviously <laughs> that was false. Um, but the, the um, you know, they've done a variety of things. They've targeted the Olympics, for example, in 2018, because they were uh, upset that uh, they were kicked out of the Olympics for doping uh, in the 2014 Sochi Olympics. So in Korea in 2018, they try to take down the opening ceremony, very petty act. But this is the type of thing that they do. You don't forget, outside of cyber, you're talking about intelligence agencies that have used chemical weapons on several occasions, one to uh, try to kill uh, a, 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 you know former um, GRU officer that uh, uh, was... Uh, uh, turned by the British and was living in retirement in, in the UK. Um, and in the process, even though they didn't manage to kill him, killed a completely innocent woman uh, that picked up the, the weapon um, in Britain. Uh, they put chemical weapons in the underwear of Alexander Navalny, uh, the famous um, um, opposition figure in Russia, and then arrested him for uh, failing to show up to uh, a, a hearing uh, because he was recovering in Berlin from the uh, chemical attack um, that was orchestrated by the state. They've used polonium in London to kill uh, Litvinenko, another former FSB officer that uh, turned on Putin. So this is the type of thing that they do in the physical world. Uh, I can assure you in cyber world, they will have no reservations to do a variety of things that damage 
um, the lives of ordinary Americans. What stops them from doing it now? Well, they don't want to escalate. Um, I do think that they believe Ukraine is, you know, their territory by right. If you listen to Vladimir Putin and his, his speech, uh, he basically made the case that Ukraine shouldn't exist as a state and it's basically been created by Russia. Um, I think he believes that. And uh, he honestly probably is puzzled of why the United States and the West care that much about this country that has always been, in, in his mind, part of Russia or part of Russia's sphere of influence. Um, but he does not want a conflict with the West. Uh, I'm not one of those people that believes that Ukraine is step one and then he rolls into Poland, the Baltics or Germany or what have you. Um, I actually think that he is afraid of NATO. And the whole reason why he is trying to take Ukraine back, one of the reasons at least, is because he does not want Ukraine to be part of NATO, where it would be protected by the Article 5 mutual defense umbrella, uh, which uh, would mean that he would confront all of NATO uh, were he uh, to have a confrontation with, with Ukraine. So I do think um, he's not going after the Baltics. I don't think he's going after other Eastern European states. But when it comes to the post-Soviet space, um, minus the Baltics, he does believe that it's his by right to have influence over it. He's basically reestablished influence, almost complete influence over Belarus um, over the last year and a half. Uh, he did the same in Kazakhstan last month uh, during the attempted coup there. And uh, I'm sure he will try to do the same in Georgia and Armenia, potentially Azerbaijan in the coming years. But um, um, that, that's kind of his ambition. A lot of people say that he wants to recreate the Soviet Union I actually don't think that's the case. I think he actually, if you listen to him carefully, he actually bashes uh, quite, quite extensively the leaders of the former Soviet Union, all of them, Lenin, Stalin, Brezhnev, uh, uh, certainly Gorbachev, uh, Khrushchev as well. Um, and, and he is quite complimentary of the czars. In fact, I think he thinks of himself as a new czar that's trying to rebuild the old Russian empire as opposed to the old Soviet Union. What you've obviously followed Putin carefully over the years. Um, what did you make of his speech? And like, where, so, you know, some analysts said he seemed kind of to be unraveling some, like he just kind of rambling and not all there as much as he was. What, but others, you know, he say he's very shrewd. It's a hard to get a read on him. What do you think? He is shrewd. And uh, the way he's planned this uh, operation in Ukraine, uh, most people don't appreciate this. This was exceedingly well executed by the book plan to build the largest invasion force that Europe has seen in the last 50 years since the invasion of Czechoslovakia by the Soviet Union in the 60s. So um, you have a, a situation where really around the same time last year, they basically started the initial buildup of forces. We saw a huge piece of that last spring. Then they stopped a little bit during the summer while they were negotiating with Biden in, in, at that Geneva summit, and then later resumed uh, over the course of the fall and uh, now have completed um, that mobilization of basically two thirds of the battalion tactical groups in the Russian military. Enormous uh, amount of firepower, uh, equipment and personnel that they've brought to the border. They're now in attack formations right at the border, just a few kilometers away and can go at a moment's notice. Um, when it comes to the speech, I do think that um, he was trying to articulate to the Russian public, and, and now you see the Russian propaganda on television really go in and force of how Ukraine is not a country, how Ukraine is a major threat um, to Russia uh, if it's under Western influence of, you know, the influence of the, uh, uh, you know, American puppets, as, as they say, uh, in Russia, and um, that it needs to be brought to heel. Uh, and... Um, uh, you know, there are people that after that speech were, were still claiming that, well, maybe he'll just stop at the Donbass with the recognition of these republics. Maybe he'll try to grab a little more territory. Um, you know, those people weren't listening to that speech carefully. Um, he barely mentioned the Donbass. The entire speech was about Ukraine. He actually brought up the nuclear weapons charge. He said that the Ukrainian is going to pursue nuclear weapons, something he repeated again yesterday in his press conference. Just an abs absurd charge, of course. Uh, Ukraine has, has no, no nuclear weapons program, has no interest in building nuclear weapons, will never be allowed to build nuclear weapons. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think he's trying to borrow the old WMD invasion uh, playbook um, that, of course, we use to invade Iraq and try to do the same thing with Ukraine. But has he learned, he, does he learn the lessons of history? Like, does he, I don't think he has enough troops to pull this off and not 
leave some insurgency? Do you think he has not Isn't he worried about I, I think that, another Afghanistan and a, you know, these Ukrainians don't seem very happy that this is happening? Or do you think that he'll be able to quell, quell everything and get out? I, I think that there's a lot of mirror imaging happening among Western analysts about how hard it's going to be for him, given our experience in Iraq and Afghanistan. First of all, Ukraine is not Iraq or Afghanistan. Uh, very, very different place. Um, the population is, is you know, well-educated and um, uh, you know, decently well-off. It's not the richest country in the world, but it's not the poorest either. So you, you don't have the conditions for people to, you know, to put on suicide belts and, and go fight the Russians. There'll be some people that will do that, of course. Um, but um, uh, there are a couple of things that people need to understand. One, from a terrain perspective, particularly Eastern Ukraine, is completely flat. There is very little uh, forced recover. It's mostly fields of corn and, um, uh, and, and the cities surrounding them. Um, and um, uh, that's not ideal for, for an insurgency. Second, uh, Russia probably has the best uh, 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 record of fighting counterinsurgencies in the world uh, over the last 100 years. If you look at what they've done in Chechnya, where you have a, a jihadist uh, uh, you know, Sunni insurgency uh, that was very vicious and, and um, uh, very uh, entrenched and a terrain that was ideal for an insurgency, mountains, valleys, forests, um, uh, plenty of places for them to hide. The Russians have basically crushed it in a, in a three, three to four years. Um, and they crushed it with utmost brutality. Uh, there was an amazing interview I've read uh, back in 2015 by this jihadist, Chechen jihadist, who was in Istanbul, was being interviewed by The Guardian, and he was on the way to Syria to fight with ISIS. And they asked him, why are you going to Syria? You could be you know, back in your homeland fighting the Russian infidels. Um, um, and he said, well, it is, um, it is safer for me to be in Syria fighting the Americans and, and Assad uh, than it is for me to be in, in Chechnya because I'm holed up in the mountains. I have to come down to get resupplied the minute I show up in the villages, everyone has mobile phones. They will call in the FSB and they're going to shoot me. And, and they know, the villagers know that if they don't call in the FSB, uh, the Russians are going to go in and massacre the whole village. That is how the Russians fight counterinsurgencies with utmost brutality. And, and I think they'll do the same thing in Ukraine um, and, and we'll be able to suppress um, the insurgency. Uh, the other thing that, that is important to realize is that there has been deep infiltration of Ukraine by Russian intelligence services over the last 20 years. Um, and the Ukrainians know that. So imagine you're a soldier in the Ukrainian army who is a patriot who wants to go fight the Russians um, and you're sitting in a trench with your buddy and you suspect that your buddy is a Russian agent. Um, that's not a great precondi precondition to, to, uh, to fight an insurgency uh, when you can't even trust uh, the people you're fighting with. And that's the reality that the Ukrainians are gonna be um, uh, facing in this conflict. And when it comes to the Ukrainian military, they're going to be so outmatched, unfortunately, uh, because of the firepower that the Russians have brought in. The artillery, the ballistic missiles, the thermobaric um, uh, weapons that basically suck up oxygen and suffocate people, um, uh, airstrikes, they've brought in 550 bomber aircraft um, to the region to, to, to conduct just um, completely um, uh, uh, um, uh, completely <clears throat> unrestrained and um, uh, camp uh, air campaign that will not care at all about civilian casualties, but will try to decimate um, any opposition. So that's that's what the Russians are going to execute here. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, I think they're going to be successful um, and it's going to be very difficult for the Ukrainians to resist. What steps now back on the cyber front, because I think that's why a lot of people are here. What steps can companies and individuals take? Let's say this escalates and you know, the Russians take, you know, throw their ransomware guys back at us and, and start, you know, trying to get our infrastructure and businesses and things like that, trying to hack them. What can we, what can we do? Well, one, uh, the U.S. government, the Department of Homeland Security has initiated this campaign that they're calling Shields Up. Essentially outreach, uh, particularly to critical infrastructure companies in the United States, letting them know that even though they don't have any specific intelligence on what the Russians may do, um, they should be aware, they should be focused on resiliency, detection, rapid response to anything that they may face. Um, so that's an important piece of it. Um, I think that we need to be, again, as I said, very thoughtful about the types of sanctions we impose upon Russia 
we obviously have to hit back. We can't allow them to uh, you know, change the, the borders of Europe through force like this. Uh, but we also can't corner them. Uh, anyone that's, that's uh, been a hunter knows that there's nothing more dangerous than a wounded animal that's been cornered. And that's exactly the position that we don't want to put, uh, to put Putin in. Um, I would much rather see us go after the oligarchs and their wealth, including um, um, the uh, wealth of uh, government officials around Putin, um, seize those assets in London and Monaco and everywhere else where they're holding real estate and holding bank accounts, et cetera. Um, I think that would be a much better um, outcome than, than trying to go after Russia's ma major industry. Um, and then from a military perspective, we have to beef up NATO, obviously, to reassure our allies that um, our Article 5 means something to us. But the other thing that's going to be really important, I believe, is um, um, what Putin himself is advertising to us that he's very concerned about. In almost every speech, and he did that again on Monday, he talks about these MK-41 uh, missile batteries that we have deployed in Poland and Romania um, as part of our uh, missile defense shield. And he believes uh, that those mis uh, missile defense systems can be turned into offensive weapons with tomahawks that can reach Moscow. And he talks about how, you know, as part of his pretext for invasion, invading Ukraine, that those systems can be um, showing up on Russia's borders in Ukraine because they would have a five minute flight time to Moscow and they could potentially be armed with nuclear payload. Um, well, if that's what he's afraid of, I think we should give him um, that outcome by putting those uh, batteries in b the Baltic states where they could have a very short range to St. Petersburg and to Moscow. Um, not unlike what we did in the 80s uh, when President Reagan put Pershing missiles in Europe, um, that ultimately led to negotiations of arms control agreements and the Intermediate Range Ballistic Missile Treaty um, um, because the Soviets were so afraid of those missiles. I think that can give us leverage yet again. Um, to try to get to, to an acceptable outcome. Because we have to start thinking now about the day after, right? Let's say he invades, let's say he's successful and he changes the government in Kiev. What are our objectives now as the United States? We still have to come to some sort of resolution with Russia and we need leverage for those talks. Well, what as individuals or companies can we do to protect ourselves from like cyber attacks with, from Ru Russia or China? Or Russia seems to be the worst criminal actors, but China's not far behind or about equal? Like, what can we do? Well, China, of course, is very different. They focus more on theft of data and intellectual property theft in order to benefit their own industry. So essentially engaging in the type of economic warfare. Uh, but uh, whether it's criminal actors, whether it's nation state actors like Russia and China, really, really important for companies to uh, have an assumed breach mentality. Essentially, assume that someone is inside your network, continuously try to find um, those actors look for any abnormalities that may exist on the network and then responding very quickly. It's really all about speed, uh, speed of detection, speed of response. That's how you can get ahead of the threat. It's interesting because I have some friends at the Wall Street Journal. I used to work there and I was texting them. They're like, they switched me over to Signal, which is an encrypted app for those who don't know. Right away, I'm like, well, dude, we're friends. We're just talking baseball. Why are, why are you switching to Signal? Like, well, the Chinese are in our systems right now and we they just announced they got hacked and we have to assume that they are. So now everything we're doing on signal. And like, you know, that's really cumbersome, but it's not, it's actually kind of smart to hack journalists because we're talking to people and they get some, you know, compromising information on who my sources are, maybe. I don't know. But um it's interesting that we're in that kind of space now. Like, is that something that we should all be thinking about? Should like I be using signal and encrypted apps with my wife when I'm talking about things? I don't know. Or should I, my, can I rely on my text messages? I don't know. So I'm a huge fan of Signal. It's a great app, free app um, built by a nonprofit foundation. Um, There's really, really secure, the most secure um, chat app, texting app that you can have. And it's really easy to use, uh, whether it's an Android or, or iPhone, um, or even on, your, on your, your computer, you can easily install it and use it just like you use iMessage or uh, SMS. So I, I believe everyone should be using it, uh, even for their normal communication. One of the really great things about Signal is it, it has the self-destruct feature yes. where you can set up a, set it up to automatically delete uh, any messages after an hour or a day or even in five minutes. Um, really, really great practice to make sure you leave as little digital exhaust as possible uh, because the reality is anyone can get hacked. And last thing you want is for your private messages with your loved ones or with your fans or whatever to be out for the world to see. 
um, and um, 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 apps like Signals are just fantastic best practice, um, not just against uh, sophisticated actors like Russia or China, but you know, just uh, you know, a, a random criminal that stumbles upon your password somewhere and manages to get access to your your information. What um, have you ever been hacked? Has anyone ever gotten through your defenses? Uh, not that I know of. Not that you know of. But isn't aren't you supposed to like live on the assumption that you have been hacked already? I've been at yeah. meetings with the Justice Department with Mark Ramondi, who's the spokesman to help line this up in some ways, and with uh, National Security Division folks. And their thing is, assume you're already hacked. Assume they're already in your system. Shouldn't you already? You just said no, but I, shouldn't you assume that they're? Well, I assume so. I, you asked me if I know, and oh, I don't. Know. You don't know. Okay, but you assume uh, that they are. Uh, I, I always try to assume that they are indeed, and I always look for them. And so far, I haven't been able to find them. And, and I'm, I'm decently good at trying to find uh, trying to find hackers. I have a little bit of experience in doing that. <laughs> what? Um, I think this is. You know, we're running out of we're we're running out of time for our talk, and we're going to be turning soon to the Q and A from the audience. And I was like, what was the most interesting cat and mouse catching of a hacker in a system that you, you don't have to get into specifics on what the company was, or but like, there's a story that like, if we were having beers, having beers, or we were doing shots of vodka, perhaps because of your <laughs> Russian ancestry. And we were just like, dude, tell me, tell me the best tale you got about catching some hackers. What, what would that tale be? There's so many, but you know, some of the best ones are certainly with Russians, um, Russian intelligence services. And um, you know, over the years, as we hunted them, as we uh, pursued them out of networks that they've been in, um, we found that they started to change. It used to be the minute we find them and the minute they just realize they discover it, they just uh, scoot out and, and disappear. And then over time, they became more and more brazen where they would try to fight back. And at one point, they would try to do counterintelligence on who is, uh, you know, part of the team that that's investigating them. And even uh, when they would register kind of new domains that they were using their attacks, put in in the registration of the domain the name of the incident responders that are, um, you know, fighting them back to let them know that we know who you are, just like you know who we are. Um, so those are some of the uh, more interesting um, uh, cyber in, uh, tit for tats that I've been involved in. Is there ever a hacker from like the Russian FSB that you just came across all the time? You're like, you know, I would love to meet this guy, you know, and just be like, what are you doing, man? Like, is it, do you have like a, um, an Ahab and a, are you like in a whale or <laughs> is there anything uh, like that? You know, they rotate pretty quickly through that. And uh, some of them are now well known because they work for cybersecurity companies in Russia. So you sort of just like, not unlike how we have it in the US where someone goes into the intelligence community works for NSA for a few years and comes out and uh, you know starts a company and uh, goes on to have a lucrative career in the private sector. The same thing is happening in Russia. So I, I know quite a, the, a few of those folks that have those backgrounds. Would you ever hire one of them to design your cybersecurity? <laughs> no way, right? <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. Is there um, are there any last thoughts you'd like to leave us with before we turn it over to questions from the audience? Anything that um, well. I should have asked yeah, you. I, you know, again, like just last comment here, um, really, really important to watch carefully how the Biden administration responds with sanctions against Russia as part of this conflict. So far, the sanctions have been pretty minor um, that they've put a, a, on them in response to the recognition of these two separatist republics. Um, the banks that they've sanctioned are really more internal banks that um, don't do a whole lot with the Western world and uh, won't be much impacted by sanctions. Um, if that continues, uh, we might be okay in terms of great escalation. Um, if they sanction Bear Bank, um, which is the main bank in Russia, state-owned, that really is used by virtually the entire Russian public population, people that get their uh, pensions from the government, get, get it through Bear Bank, that's going to be very significant. Gazprom Bank, another one uh, that is used, um, obviously, by Gazprom, they're, they're a big gas company, to facilitate payments abroad, investments in infrastructure. That's going to be very painful. If they do the semiconductor ban, that's going to be very painful as well. So if, if those uh, sanctions go into place, I, I would advise everyone to start to expect Russian retaliation response. That's going to be a key signal to watch. Well, thank you very much. Um, I think it's time, uh, William, to 
to take some questions from the audience. Um, and Dimitri, you were awesome. This was a fun conversation. And uh, William, I'm letting you take over. Thank you so much, Dell. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Dell. Those are great questions you came up with. Uh, Dimitri, we have a few uh, we have a few questions here. I can't seem to get my video to start. It won't let me start. But anyway, that's okay. Um, this one is has to do with with the Swift system. The uh, the uh, there we go. Okay, the Swift uh, International Banking Communication Platform. That some people have said is uh, they're going to be shut out of that. Um, do you think that's the case? And what would that, that would probably not, that would probably not good for, be good for anyone, right? No, and the Biden administration started to walk that back a few weeks ago because they realized it would actually be counterproductive. Um, the Russians, after, you have to realize that the Russians after 2014 and after some of the initial sanctions on them, realized that sanctions in their view were inevitable and they started to really bulletproof in their economy against that. And one of the first things they looked at is SWIFT, and they developed their own SWIFT alternative that they call uh, SPFS, um, System for Transfer of Financial Messages. Um, and um, they've deployed it across the Russian banks, some of the banks overseas, not many Western banks right now. But if, if sanctions were to go in place on, on um, the Russian bank's use of SWIFT, guess what would happen? You would still need to transact with Russia. You would still need to buy Russian gas and oil. You would still need to pay them for their critical materials. Um, you would still need to pay your employees if you're a multinational that, um, that, that, are, that are in Russia. So you'd still need to transfer money somehow. And if you can't use SWIFT to do it, guess what? Um, you're going to use SPFS. So you would, in, in effect, encourage the adoption of a Russian alternative of SWIFT in a matter of days across numerous banks in, in Western Europe and, and maybe even in the United States. So it would be extraordinarily counterproductive move and would actually give Russia more power, not less. And I'm glad that they walked it back. Wow. Okay, well, this question says, as part of its sanctions, does the US or any of its allies possess any cyber weapon resources sufficient to restrain the Russians? Well, again, uh, we are the best in the world at cyber offense, make no mistake about it. But um, we also have a lot of lawyers and every single cyber operation has to be reviewed by numerous lawyers uh, to make sure that it abides by the arms, uh, laws of armed conflict, that it does not inflict um, a disproportionate number of civilian casualties uh, or casualty, or I should say damaged civilian infrastructure. So we are gonna be extraordinarily restrained in our use of cyber offense. We've always been that way. The Russians won't be. So even though they're not as good at us technically, it doesn't actually matter um, if they're gonna be unconstrained in their operations. So could we harm them? Absolutely. And I expect that we would if there is um, massive cyber attacks on us, but um, then we just get into this tit for tat that, that is extraordinarily dangerous. But can we actually stop them? No. We cannot. We can. If that ma magic bullet existed, we would have used it a long, long time ago. And you'd be a billionaire and retired, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, it seems in this digital age that there's no way to ensure security uh, while simultaneously exhi exhibiting res restraint and respect for human rights. Are we going to just see a continually ceaseless march? towards, I'm, I'm quoting here, authoritarianism, paranoia, and perpetual insecurity. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. Uh, I do think that you know, one of the problems that we see here is that when you've got a major nuclear power with you know, one of the largest standing armies in the world that wants to do something in its neighborhood against uh, a country that is not in a military defensive alliance with anyone else, they can do it. And, um, you know, we don't have a framework for stopping them short of going to war. And uh, we're not going to go to war with Russia over this. OK, well, um, I asked you the, the, the major questions and you've got to go with us soon. Do you have any uh, closing remarks for us that might be a little more uh, up, up, upside as far as the future? Well, look, um, the, the, the upside is I was just at the Munich Security Conference, um, uh, which is an annual gathering of, of NATO members and um, 
uh, and European leaders and, and, and um, US government leaders as well. Uh, the type of unity that I saw there uh, this past weekend, uh, I've not seen. I've been going to Munich for a long time now. Um, and um, the, the, the world really is united, the Western world at least, uh, in confronting Russian aggression. They're not going to fight for Ukraine, but they're going to make sure that it stops at Ukraine and that there's not going to be further incursions in any of the NATO countries. Um, and, you know, post, you know, a difficult period for the Western alliance in the last few years where there was concern about America's commitment to Europe, it was good to see that um, there is um, not much daylight now between the um, uh, Europe and the United States on these critical issues. Um, that's very encouraging, actually. I, I read that, but I wasn't sure it was true. But you're, thank you very much. Uh, it really is true. Um, and and you know, one of the things that really amazed me is that the uh, virtually every conversation at the conference, no matter the topic, obviously revolved around Russia and Ukraine. Uh, but a lot of them were also about China. And in the past, I got to tell you, it was such a pull from the American side to get the Europeans to care about China, the rise of China, the threat that it poses. Um, uh, and this year, it was the Europeans that were raising their concerns about um, China, its authoritarianism, its uh, uh, trade practices. Um, so that was really interesting to see as well, that they're finally starting to realize that America is not the problem and that uh, they do have to worry about uh, the Chinese. And there was one comment that was made to me uh, by uh, a member of the European Parliament who said, you know, we really hate these American tech giants. We think they're really, really bad. They don't respect uh, European laws and traditions. They don't respect our privacy. But you know what? The Chinese companies are so much worse. And, and I'll, <laughs> I'll take that. Well, I've lived in China and done business there for almost 40 years, and I can certainly believe that's true. Thank you so much, Dimitri, for your time. And Dale, you also for really great questions, by the way. We really Excellent. appreciate you being part of our, our webinar today. And I know you have to go, but uh, it was incredibly interesting and extremely timely. <laughs> as a matter I appreciate of it. And Dale, thank you so thank much. Thank you very much. Yeah. You had great, thank you very great much. questions. Okay. Bye bye. Uh, okay, I'll let them go. And I just wanted to tell you that uh, we're going to get up on the screen here shortly uh, some of the uh, events that we have coming up in the World Affairs Council of Orange County out here on the left coast. Um, we're going to, we have a March 3rd, we have an interesting. Uh, webinar coming up that has to do, uh, that is uh, by, with one of the Belarus opposition leaders that was actually, I think she won the election when they had their election, but she's now in exile nearby. And then on March 8th, we've got uh, Secretary Leon Panetta, who's been Secretary of Defense, Director of CIA, and a tremendous uh, world leader in uh, that knows what's going on. We also have, um, Next week, we've got an uh, in-person event, as a matter of fact, with Dr. James Coyle on Russia's borders, wars, and frozen conflicts. It seems like there's a trend here. Uh, but I wanted to uh, uh, let you know a little bit about the World Affairs Council of Orange County. During the pandemic, we had, I think, close to 50 of these webinars. We're very, very proud of that. And we'd like uh, to continue providing quality program for free, which we do. But uh, please don't hesitate to donate to our mission on our website. We're grateful for your generosity. We thank you for uh, joining us and please sign up for our, uh, our current upcoming programs. And thank you very much. Goodbye for today. <laughs>